Hello and welcome to News Center. I'm Parikshit Lutra. The big international story moving markets worldwide. Iran unleashed over 300 drones and missiles into Israel on Sunday, setting afoot the possibility of a larger regional conflict. Israel military says a large number of projectiles were intercepted outside the country's borders with the help of United States, UK and France. Iran's aggression comes as a retaliation to Israel's attack on its consulate in Syria earlier this month. The United Nations Security Council gathered for an urgent meeting to address the escalating tensions. Israel called for fresh sanctions on Iran, but Iran hit back, saying it has a right to self-defense after Israel attacked its consulate. UN Secretary General called for restraint, saying that the world cannot afford another war. The G7 leaders held a virtual meeting and condemned Iran's attack and reaffirmed commitment to Israel's security. But the US has refused uh, to take part in any retaliatory action against Iran. The regional flare-up has also sparked trouble for airlines, with many airlines, including Qantas, United Airlines and Air India, suspending operations to these regions. Israel's war cabinet is holding a meeting to discuss the next course of action. The Middle East is on the brink. The people of the region are confronting a real danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. Now is the time to defuse and de-escalate. Now is the time for maximum restraint. To take this discussion forward, I'm now joined by Sayed Mohammad Marandi, professor at the University of Tehran, former Indian ambassador to Iran, K.C. Singh, and former Indian ambassador to Israel, Arun Kumar Singh. He's also the former permanent mission of India to the UN. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining us on the program. Uh, Prof professor Marandi, how do you see the responses coming in, especially from the G7, strongly condemning Iran's attack against Israel, saying that they strongly stand behind Israel and U.S. support to Israel remains ironclad. Uh, how does Iran find itself after carrying out this retaliatory strike? Well, it's not surprising. This is, of course, the G7, uh, the white man's club. So they are going to definitely support one another when it comes to the global south and the, the rest of the world. Uh, the fact is that the Iranians have shown years of strategic patience when the Israelis carried out provocation after provocation. Over the past few months alone, the Israeli regime repeatedly violated the Assyrian airspace and killed a number of Iranian officers. And the Iranians didn't respond directly because they wanted to keep the focus on the ongoing and Western-backed genocide in Gaza. And in, addition, and in addition to that, over the past decade, when the West, NATO, Israel, and their regional partners were supporting ISIS and al-Qaeda in uh, Syria, when they were supporting these extremist groups, we know, for example, that Jake Sullivan, the current National Security Advisor of the United States, wrote a letter to Hillary Clinton on February the 12th, 2012, released by WikiLeaks, that in Syria, Al-Qaeda is on our side. So when Iran was fighting Al-Qaeda, or when Iran was fighting ISIS in Syria, and we also have a leaked audio of John Kerry, the back, back then who was Secretary of State, uh, later on after Hillary Clinton, saying uh, in that leaked audio that the United States allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus. So when back then Iran was fighting ISIS, which Israel was supporting, the Israelis would attack Iranian targets in Syria, and again, back then, Iran showed strategic patience. But this time around, the Israeli regime struck an embassy. And of course, in the UN Security Council, the United States, Britain, and France, three members of the G7, refused to condemn this. And basically, they were supporting the law of the jungle, as long as the law benefits them. So when they refused to condemn it, they effectively condoned it. And they didn't punish Israel, obviously. So Iran had the, the obligation to defend its citizens and its sovereignty. Because if Iran did not do so, the Israeli regime would bomb more embassies from here on, especially since they have the Western support from the West. So the Iranians carried out a retaliation, but the Iranian retaliation was very smart in the sense that the Iranians used very cheap drones and they didn't use their latest technology. And they said beforehand that they're sending the drones. So the Israelis basically spent uh, 1.3 and the Americans billion dollars of their latest technology 
uh, shooting down drones that costs each for Iran roughly $10,000. So the Iranians spent a couple of million dollars and a few older uh, uh, missiles to as decoys to make them show their latest technology, but also waste uh, a billion and a half dollars effectively, whereas the Iranians spent uh, a few million dollars altogether. And then the third wave uh, of missiles, which was between 10 to 20, I don't know the exact number, went and struck two military bases. Unlike the Israelis who strike civilian targets in Gaza, the Iranians struck a base in the south that holds, that is very well protected, and the missiles got through. Uh, where the F-35s are, and in the North A intelligence gathering base that also belongs to the Air Force where a number of missiles struck there as well, both two very well-protected sites. So the, the Israelis and the Americans and the Europeans both exposed their capabilities. They emptied their reserves. They spent a lot of money, and the Iranians didn't show their hand and uh, didn't spend much money. Right. So you're saying that uh, with the low-cost operation, uh, Professor Mirandi, Iran was able to do what it got out to. It wanted to achieve the target of deterrence in a way, make sure Israel does not attack uh, Iranian embassies in future. But a question about India here. In the run-up to this attack, this 300-missile drone attack that had taken place, there was a Israel-linked ship the MSC Ares, which had been seized by Iranian authorities. Now, that had 17 Indian crew members on board. Now, India has been seeking the release of these 17 Indian crew members. Uh, is that likely to happen soon? I know this is something that the Iranian government has to decide, but what could be the reason? One can understand the reason for detaining an Israeli-linked ship, but uh, what would be the reason to continue detaining Indian nationals? Well, I, uh, you know that I'm not uh, in the government and I'm an academic. This is my office on campus. I just came out of class, so I can't speak on behalf of everyone, anyone. But obviously, Iran has very good relations with India, especially the north-south corridor that's now being developed between Iran and Russia. Uh, India will pay, uh, be a key part of that north-south corridor. So I think in the coming years, the relationship between India and Iran will uh, significantly uh, expand and become more important. So taking all that into account, I'm, I'm sure that the Iranians will find a solution to that. The problem that Iran has is that the Israeli regime is carrying out genocide. This ship was affiliated to the Israeli regime, and Iran is basically implementing the genocide convention, which is understandable. Uh, people here see children being slaughtered every day with the support of the West, with Western weapons. And of course, just like the embassy case, when the Israelis bombed the embassy, the West refused from condemning it. And then the G7 white man's club goes and immediately condemns Iran when it responded to the uh, horrific Israeli provocation. So the, the, the issue is Israel between Iran and the Israeli regime. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that there will be a solution for the uh, Indian uh, citizens. Right. Uh, Professor Mirandi, I'll request you to stay with us. I'll take one question each from our panelists and then return to you. I know uh, you have to leave. But uh, Ambassador Casey saying, how do you see the situation currently, especially for India? We have 18,000 uh, Indians working and studying in Israel, 4,000 and in Iran. Uh, we also have at least 60 to 65 Indian workers who've traveled very recently as part of the agreement between India and Israel. Uh, there's a question mark and uncertainty for them as well. Uh, what's at stake for Indians in these regions? Look, there is a danger all over the region. It's not that the Indians in the Gulf would feel any safer because the confrontation is between Iran and Israel. Uh, if the Iranians are hit, and if the Israelis come in this time, they may go after their nuclear assets and their nuclear infrastructure. And then the Iranians will have uh, will not sit still. Because remember when uh, General Soleimani was killed by the Americans in a drone strike, even that time the Iranians retaliated and they fired some missiles at American facilities in Iraq and northern Syria. So some retaliation was expected. But this time, because an embassy was the um, building of the embassy was attacked, and there I agree with your previous speaker that really uh, the rest of the world has not expressed the same shock 
about a diplomatic mission getting bombed by Israel. And the Israelis have simply drawn the Americans into a battle. They provoked Iran. And uh, there are reports that ne they never took Americans into confidence on this. And the Americans have been drawn into this confrontation. Uh, and that is why the Americans had to move their ships. Because all they could then do was, and I think the Iranians were quite smart, uh, they gave enough advance information. They wanted to basically just challenge the deterrence uh, that Israel had created. They wanted to create a psychological impact that they could fire those missiles. They chose a target which was out in the desert. Mm. And they knew that human life would mm. not be lost. A bit like what happened after Pulwama. You remember the Ameri Pakistani jets mm. came in. They fired a rocket at one corner of an Indian military camp. The idea, I think, was not so much to kill anyone mm. as to show that they have hit back. So mm. essentially, the Israelis have... Mm. Uh, there's minimum damage called, caused. But the Americans, of course, were mm. also providing cover. It's not just the Iron Dome. Uh, there mm. were at least two American ships which were mm. firing missiles uh, to counter whatever the Iron Dome was mm. not able to handle. Uh, so now the only question is, where do we go mm. from here? Because if the Iranians do not listen mm. to the Americans, uh, the Israelis do not listen to the Americans mm. and want to retaliate, though their problem mm. would be, which, ta which where do their planes go? So one of the things which is being written about is they have four submarines. Small, very small submarines mm. which can come to the Indian Ocean and they probably have five mm. or six missiles on each. So they could use missiles mm. to, to target mm. some facilities. But then this time the Iranians will come mm. full hawk. They've got many more missiles. And then you've got mm. Hezbollah sitting with almost mm. uh, 10,000, 20,000 missiles right on the border of, uh, uh, of Israel, where Israel doesn't get that, that much time mm. to counter an attack once mm. the missiles are launched out of southern mm. Lebanon. So it's reached a point where I think Netanyahu mm. needs to be uh, to reeled in. Uh, he needs to be put on a leash. He's mm. done this to take the attention away from the killing of civilians, uh, from the spread of famine and the uh, humanitarian crisis right. which has been caused in Gaza. Uh, and secondly, the demands, Gaza. because protests were starting in Israel again, and demands for him to resign at a fresh mm. election. So with this, he has diverted right. the attention from that. And he's a master at that. But now the question okay. is, can the Americans contain him? Right. Ambassador Casey Singh, that's a very important point. Let me get in uh, Ambassador Arun Singh at this point. Ambassador Arun Singh, as we speak, the Israeli war cabinet is meeting. Uh, they are saying that all options are on the table as far as a response to Iran is concerned. Do you think current, currently the political situation and the geopolitical situation uh, in which Netanyahu finds himself he will take the risk of escalating and carrying out an attack on Iran? Uh, Parikshit, so they'll have to do their calculation as to what is in their uh, short-term uh, objective. Because at one level, they've said, and it is their narrative, because Professor Barandi uh, you know, pointed out how things look from the Iranian perspective. But uh, just looking at uh, how the Israelis have described their perspective, uh, uh, They've said that uh, the kind of attack that Hamas did on October 7 was the sing you know, largest single-day loss of life, Jewish life after the Holocaust. But they need to respond. Uh, they've set the objective for themselves uh, to eliminate Hamas and their presence in Gaza. Now, whether they are able to achieve that or not remains to be seen, uh, because uh, past history has shown that it is difficult to completely eliminate organizations like Hamas or to completely uh, eliminate an ideology. But we have to see what is the objective uh, they have set for themselves. So I think the Israeli leadership probably have to take a call. What is their immediate uh, objective? Is it to focus on the Hamas or is it to widen uh, the conflict that is playing out? Now, at one level, escalation has happened uh, stage by stage. This is not the first time. Uh, because uh, whatever Hamas did on October 7 could be seen as an escalation compared to the period before October 7. And the kind of action Israel has taken in Gaza, um, now going on for more than six months, is also an escalation. At the same time, uh, while Israel has been taking action, Hezbollah, the Houthis, uh, and sometimes groups based in Iraq, have been taking action against Israeli and American interests, and the Houthi action is against international interests in the Red Sea. That too is an escalation. 
And I think the Israeli hit, although they have not officially claimed it, but the Israeli hit on the Iranian embassy premises is an escalation. And the Iranian response is an escalation. So we are seeing escalation at different stages. But clearly it is in, I think, everybody's interest, including India's interest, not to see a region-wide conflagration, because that will have unpredictable consequences for everyone. And for us, it's a question of our energy security. Right. It's a question not just of Iranian, Indians in uh, Israel and Iran, but 8 million Indian workers in the entire mm. Gulf region. Uh, so if you see the calls from everywhere right. are to maintain uh, some restraint. And um, so, so we have to see how the Israeli work out their political calculation. Right. Uh, we are going to take a short break at this point. Uh, this is getting very interesting. We will stay with this. We'll stay with all our guests. We request uh, Professor Marandi, Ambassador Casey Singh and Arun Singh to stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are uh, discussing the escalating tensions in the Middle East. Uh, and whether Israel is going to respond to Iran after Iran fired 300 drones and missiles at the country for the Israeli attack on uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Let me go back to our guest, Ambassador Arun Singh, Ambassador Casey Singh and Professor Marandi joining us from the University of Tehran. Uh, Professor Marandi, one last question before we let you leave. Uh, was this also aimed in a way at the IMEC corridor, which Europe, United States, India, all these nations are working together on. And secondly, if Israel does carry out the attack, what is going to be the response from Iran? And how do you think this is going to divide the Middle East, the Islamic world? Uh, where do you find Russia and China uh, in all of this? Well, if, if the Israeli regime strikes Iran again, the, the uh, Iranians have promised to give a much heavy, uh, much heavier response to the Israeli regime. So this attack by Iran or this retaliation or this response to the Israeli aggression was basically to empty their, uh, uh, them of their missile defense capabilities, to understand their capabilities. It was an intelligence gathering operation and uh, so that they can prepare for a real uh, offensive uh, strike. So next time around, the Iranians will be sending thousands of drones and missiles, and they will obviously include many high-tech missiles uh, in the strike. So the, the smart thing for the Israeli regime to do is to refrain from doing anything stupid. The, the regime has more than enough on its hands. Uh, it has destroyed its uh, credibility across the world by carrying out genocide. It's shown that it's weak. It's been unable to capture Gaza, which is a dot on the map after six months, and it has failed to, to do anything significant alongside the Lebanese border. So the Israeli regime has shown itself to be weak intelligence-wise, weak strategic in, in carrying out strategy, as we saw in the Iranian drone strikes, where the Iran's have basically uh, fired uh, decoys, and the Israelis right. and the Americans gave them all they had. So. Uh, but the, the real issue is it has nothing to do with corridor. It has to do with ethno supremacism. It has to do with Western colonization, just like the experience that India has, the experience that Iran has and has in other countries in the global south for centuries, and Western domination. The people in Gaza were expelled from their lands. Okay. They are refugees. They're the children of refugees. And they've been constantly slaughtered by the Israelis for decades. And they are surrounded. It's been a Mm. Uh, under siege for for many years, and the Israelis would repeatedly carry out strikes and uh, and massacres in Gaza over the past years in 2008, nine, even when they had peaceful protests like the Great uh, Walk of Return. Uh, the Israelis would shoot down okay. ordinary people. So the the solution is for a ju for justice, for equality among young people in in the, the land of Palestine. And Israel ultimately will have to accept All that. right. Uh, we cannot live in an, an, a, right. an, a world where apartheid is gone. The last apartheid state has mm -hmm. to come to the conclusion, like in South Africa, that all human beings are equal and the land has to be shared. And, it, and it's beneficial for Jews, 
Christians and Muslims right. for a just solution. This, the, the Israelis don't want okay. this, but that is the only way out. All right. Thank you, uh, Professor Marandi, for joining us. Let me go back to Ambassador Casey Thank Singh. You. Ambassador Casey Singh, how angry do you feel is uh, the Islamic world, the Gulf nations, where do they stand as of now in case things worsen? Uh, how are we going to find ourselves? You see, the Gulf nations, the GCC members, they met last week. Uh, they had a summit in Doha and they have passed a resolution and they are stuck between the Shia Shia Iran and Israel. They want to engage Israel. And that's where I think the Abraham Accords came in. That's where IMEC came in. And uh, Iran happens to be on the other side. It, it's part of the Shia crescent, which runs through Iraq and Syria and all the way to Lebanon. So there is a southern connection of the Sunnis and a northern connection of the Shias. Uh, the Sunnis are, of course, not comfortable with an ascendant Iran, but there's little they can do about it. Uh, but they also don't want an open confrontation. That's why they've all said their airports would not be available to the Americans, which means even the Israelis will not be allowed the airspace to be used for attacking Iran. Uh, we know that the Jordanians did allow the Israeli uh, aircraft to come across into the air airspace uh, to uh, meet the oncoming Iranian drones, etc. But that may be a one-off. Mm. But essentially, GCC don't want to get involved. And yet, at the same time, even though mm. in the same resolution that they passed, they've talked of stability, uh, a place for Israel in a regional security order, but they also say that something has to be done about the Palestinians. You can't just, uh, you mm. know, as was rightly put, uh, have, have a regime where you discriminate against an entire people. And that's where India is playing a very dangerous game. Because we are sending 40,000 workers to replace mm. Palestinians. That, then we are part of that Israeli game mm. where they want to deny almost a lakh and a half mm. Palestinians jobs. Now, if you do that tomorrow, mm. what may be the reaction in the Gulf? Mm. Uh, because those who are hiring mm. Indian help, they are Muslims. Uh, now, you know, what mm. will be the reaction there? Mm. I don't think it's been thought through properly. So one is the element of people, the workers mm. there. And two is them being used. They're workers mm. from India, China, uh, and also uh, Sri Lanka. Mm. They're not taking from Bangladesh. They don't mm. want any Muslims. I believe even from India, they're not taking any Muslims. So India is playing a very dangerous game mm. by aligning with a theocratic, extreme right-wing regime, uh, which will draw you into this, and then right. this may have repercussions in the Gulf. Right. Very important points. Let me take that forward with Ambassador Arun Singh. Ambassador Arun Singh, uh, 64 Indian nationals have left to work in Israel because of a Berg Agreement between the two countries. Uh, of course, there is uncertainty that they are facing. India has put out advisories asking people to be very careful in Israel and Iran not to travel to these countries. Do you think, considering the deteriorating situation, we should not have allowed that agreement to actually take off, uh, allow those Indian nationals to travel uh, from the 2nd of April onwards? So, Parikshit, I don't think it's new for Indian nationals to be going and working in Israel. As far as I know, there are more than 15,000 Indian nationals who have been working in Israel uh, for many, many years. Uh, aside from those in the IT sector, there's also a community of caregivers uh, who are there. And they've been there for a long time. Uh, similarly, there are workers in Israel from uh, Thailand, several Southeast Asian countries, Philippines. Uh, you saw uh, in the uh, uh, attack on October 7, uh, some of the workers from Thailand were impacted. So this phenomenon of workers going there uh, to work is not something new. I think my sense would be that if any agreement was done, it was just to make sure that their terms and conditions are such that their rights are protected. So that, that's the dimension. And you know, Indians have been going and living and working uh, all over the world. Uh, they're going to different countries. So when an Indian mm. gets a job um, and uh, is able to earn an income, I think the government approaches it in a certain way. Of course, when there is a conflict situation ongoing, at that precise moment, mm. uh, you know, where people take precautions. So right now, if there's a worry about a conflict, then you know, people may slow down uh, the numbers traveling. Uh, but in the principle of it, you know, Indians mm. have been going and working uh, in other countries and uh, they've been working in Israel for many, many years. It's not something new. Hmm. Right. Uh, final questions now to both our panelists. Ambassador Arun Singh, I'll start with you. David Cameron yesterday 
urged Israel to think with its head, not with the heart. Do you think the G7, even though it's calling for restraint, is really restraining uh, Netanyahu right now? So I think the problem there, Parikshit, is that uh, clearly, as in the other comments uh, in the program, uh, the Israelis have over time certainly traumatized the Palestinian population through the occupation. But the Israelis are themselves a traumatized people, uh, given their experience of the Holocaust, the discrimination they felt uh, elsewhere. And they feel that they live in a very dangerous neighborhood and they need to show strength uh, for uh, to establish deterrence. So that's the motivation they have. You know, when I was serving in Israel, uh, repeatedly one heard the phrase, never again. Never again would we allow to happen to us what happened during the Holocaust. So we have to understand where they are coming from, mm. even if one doesn't agree uh, with mm. some of the actions that they are taking. Mm. So that's the challenge they are right. facing. Okay. And the current government in Israel, right. as everybody points out, is more right-wing. Uh, they do not support a two-state solution. And so they are giving certain preference to some policy, but that's not what all Israelis think. Okay. Final question to Ambassador Casey Singh. Ambassador Casey Singh, how do you see India getting impacted in case uh, there is further escalation between uh, Israel and Iran? See, it depends. If the uh, Straits of Hormuz are blocked, then of course it affects the oil price. Already the price had gone up to 100, I believe, yesterday, uh, speculatively. Uh, so, it main thing is oil and energy supplies from the Gulf. Second is that if there is, uh, there are missiles being fired and there is exchange of arms and the Iranians take out some ships in the Gulf, uh, don't forget the Americans have a major center in Bahrain and they've got, they might have taken their ships out. Uh, and there are a number of these countries which have given space to the Americans to have their bases. Uh, now, what happens? Right. And this is what the Iranians are telling time and again, they're telling Americans, don't get in a way. We don't. We don't have a fight with you, or we have a. If we have a quarrel, we have it with the Iranian, uh, with the Israelis. Uh, then the population starts mm -hmm. getting affected. Then panic spreads, uh, and that is where then they. You know, we right. saw. Of course, Kuwait was different because Saddam Hussein actually came and occupied Kuwait, uh, so you had to bring the people out. Mm -hmm. But there may be some movement of the people. There may be some panic. Uh, largely, people stay put because they don't give an impression to the locals. Uh, that when it comes to any kind of crisis, mm. they flee. Uh, because they've got their... They've been there mm. for decades. Many of them have been born there. So they don't want to give the impression that they'll right. abandon the locals. Uh, but uh, it would certainly cause okay. panic. And more than that is the energy costs. Right. We've run out of time. But thank you very much, Ambassador Casey Singh, Ambassador Arun Singh, for joining us. Uh, definitely a very worrying situation. And it will pose an economic challenge to India as well. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of News Center. More news and updates continue right here.